This is the third in a series on graphical linear programming. Next what I'd like to discuss are some special cases and some vocabulary terms and assumptions. Uh, recall that this is our original model. First I'd like to discuss the difference between binding and non-binding constraints and the terms slack and surplus. Recall that in our original model we said that this was the optimal point. It's defined by the two constraints. So in fact, that's a, both of those constraints are binding constraints. Why are they binding? Well, recall that our solution is 12 and 6 at that point. 12 tables and 6 chairs. If you plug 12 and 6 into the left-hand side of the equation, 12 tables, 6 chairs, you get 60. So if we make 12 tables and 6 chairs, our, our resources in that constraint that we're using is 60. We're using all 60 hours in Department A. Likewise, if we stick 12 for X1 and 6 for X2 in the second constraint, you'll see that that will sum to 48. So 48 on the left-hand side, 48 on the right-hand side gives us a binding constraint. Well, what's a non-binding constraint then? Well, say for example that this point here had been the optimal solution, 15, 0. In that case, constraint number 1 is binding, but constraint number 2 is non-binding. Well, why is that? Well, if you plug 15 in for x1, you see, you'll see that that sums to 60, and that's what we're using. But if you put 15 in the second constraint, 15 times 2 is 30, and 0 for tables, or chairs, I'm sorry, uh, you'll see that that left-hand side then would sum to 30, and there are 18 hours left over that we're not using. So that's a non-binding constraint. And you can see that there's a space in between here. It does Constraint number 2 doesn't go through that point. So, in fact, what we've got then are 18 hours left over that we're not using at that point in Department B. So that's called your slack. Okay, if you've got slack, we've got 18 hours of slack, it's a non-binding constraint. Here, the slack variables are both zero, because at that point, they're both binding. Likewise, up here at this point, constraint number two, department B is binding, but constraint number one is non-binding. Next, I'd like to discuss some assumptions. The main assumption for linear programming is that all functions are linear. Well, how do you tell if something's linear or not? Well, if you've got an exponent of 1 on all your variables, they're, they're linear. If you've got any square roots, cubed roots, or squared, cubed, uh, or any other power besides 1, then it's a nonlinear function. So we're assuming everything is linear, the objective function and the constraints. If it's not linear, well, then you're in the realm of nonlinear programming. We're not really going to discuss that in this class. But I'd like you to know that you can solve nonlinear programs in Excel as well. We'll see that later. The other assumption is that, for example, if you say you're making $4 for every table, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're making one table or a thousand tables, you're making $4 for every table you produce. Now, in reality, that's, that's typically not true. For a while, there might be some economies of scale going on so that you earn more profit for the more that you produce, but at some point you're going to saturate the market and uh, your profit will perhaps go down after that point. So one way around that is to say, okay, well, my profit is $4 for production of between 1 and 20 chairs, and my profit goes up to 5 for between 20 and, and 1,000, and then it drops back down to to three for anything a thousand above or whatever. Um, but then you break it up and you define actually new variables, x1, x2, and x3 for, for those three examples. Next I'd like to discuss minimization and unboundedness. You know, sometimes you, you want to minimize problems. So if we, for example, in our, in our example problem here wanted to minimize 4x1 plus 3x2, what we would do is instead of going out, we'd be coming in. 
and we're coming in right to the origin in that case. Uh, so you would produce nothing if you wanted to minimize cost, for example. But typically you've got a case like this where you've got greater than or equal to constraints going out like that. Okay. And uh, what that does is it creates an unbounded feasible region. Well, that's not a problem if you're minimizing, because say we're minimizing this function here, uh, we probably come down, and, and then this would be the optimal point, because this unbounded feasible region, uh, you come down, and, and then, for example, that would be the, the optimal point. But what if we were maximizing? If you had an unbounded feasible region in at least one dimension, and you're maximizing, what can happen is it can go out to infinity. Well, that's called managerial utopia. Managerial utopia. Because that would imply that you could have an infinite profit, which, of course, you know doesn't exist. It's no place, just like utopia. Utopia is no place. All right, so uh, there's... In Excel, it'll probably say something like your your uh, variables do not converge. Um, it'll give you an error message, and it'll probably be an easy fix. Just change it from max to min because the default in Excel is is max. So if if you do have a minimization objective function, you need to change it to that, and then it'll converge to an optimal solution. So if if you get manager utopia, you've probably made a mistake. Next, I'd like to discuss alternate optima. Alternate optima occurs if you have more than one optimal solution. Okay. Well, when could that ever happen? That would happen, for example, if the slope of our objective function is exactly the same as the slope of one of our constraints. So, for example, that first constraint, number one, had 4x1 plus 2x2 less than or equal to 60. If our objective function had been maximize 4x1 plus 2x2 so that it would have the same slope exactly, that causes alternate optima. So this point would be op optimal, this point would be optimal, and an infinite number of points in between would be optimal as well. They'd have the same profit. Well, how do you choose then? which one to go with. Well, there might be some other variables or other con objective functions, perhaps, that you haven't considered, and maybe this point is inferior because that's only producing tables. This point might be better because that keeps you in the table and share business together. So, if you've got alternate optimal, you can use other criteria to help you decide which one to go with. But, again, I want to emphasize that they all have the same value for Z throughout that line. So that's the special case of more than one optimal solution. Redundant constraints. Well, when does that happen? Let's say that we had a third constraint that looked like this. Uh, 1x1 plus 1x2 is less than or equal to 50 in department C. Well, how does that change our problem? Our feasible region originally was down here, right? And if we throw in a new constraint that looks like that, it doesn't even touch the feasible region. So that's known as a redundant constraint. It doesn't even touch the feasible region. You can leave it in, you can take it out, it doesn't matter, it doesn't change anything in your model. You still get the optimal solutions right there, and you still get the same feasible region. So redundant constraints don't matter. Now, likely are you going to have some redundant constraints? Sure, you will, because you're going to be formulating problems with you know, um, maybe hundreds of variables and constraints, and likely some of them will be redundant. They'll always be non-binding, so they'll always have slack or surplus, but you can leave them in, you can take them out, doesn't matter, doesn't change your model anyway. Infeasibility, another special case. Well, what happens if you had this problem again? Okay, and then we th threw in a third constraint that was a greater than or equal to constraint, and these are less than or equal to constraints. 
Well, where's the feasible region? There's no overlapping region at all. So this is the case of infeasibility. Uh, what do you do? Well, there's two possibilities. You've either made a mistake, and maybe this was a less than or equal to constraint, in which case this would be feasible again. Or maybe you haven't made a mistake. Maybe your problem really is infeasible. Life is that way. Some things are infeasible. Well, what do you do then if it really is? Well, two possibilities. It depends. Are they hard constraints or can some of them be moved? If they're hard constraints, you're stuck. If you can't move them, you're stuck. But maybe we can loosen them up, loosen them up a little bit. Maybe get some more resource, move it out a little bit here, and move this one in a little bit here to here, you know, and create a little feasible region down here, which we can then say, ah, now that's the optimal point. But if you can't move them with feasibility, you're stuck. And in Excel, you'll get an error message about infeasibility. Degeneracy, and that's another special case. It's one of my personal favorites. Who's a degenerate here? Or I guess we should say, what's degeneracy? Um, degeneracy is something unusual that happens. And in this case, what, what can happen is, if you've got a point in space that's overdefined, it's degeneracy. In two dimensions, it takes two constraints to define a point. But if we get three constraints, three lines going through that point, it's degenerate. It's degenerate. Uh, why do you care? Well, it used to be we, we care about this because it would cause what's known as cycling in the simplex method that, that Danzig uh, invented. You could get, actually get stuck on that point. Because with the simplex method, what you do is you hop from extreme point to extreme point, always improving the objective function until you stop. So that can cause cycling. The final case is multiple objectives. What happens if you have multiple objectives? What happens if, you're, if your employees really like to produce tables but not chairs? Well then, this was the original object, uh, uh, solution. This would be the second one. Where's the best point? Well, it turns out the best point would be somewhere in here on the efficient frontier. And then you just have to decide which one is best on that efficient frontier. That's it.